On the first day of the relaxed lockdown of major cities, Nigeria records an all-time high number of daily coronavirus cases at 245. And a controversial bill might just have moved from the House of Representatives to the Nigerian Senate, a bit under a new name. This is Plus Politics, and I am Felicity Izewike. You're welcome to the program. Now, on the day Nigeria relaxed the lockdown of major cities, the country announces its highest number of daily coronavirus cases yet, with a figure at 245, bringing the total number of COVID-19 cases in the country to 2,802. This was announced by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. Its Director General, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwaze, has also stated that non-compliance with the lockdown easing guidelines and a surge in coronavirus cases could lead to the restoration of the lockdown. Joining me to discuss this live in the studio is political analyst Francis Chilaka. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> we'll be joined a little later uh, via Skype uh, by Olamide Okulaja. Uh, we hope we can uh, connect with him. All right, let's get started and just look at highest number so far. Is there a connection, as people are saying, um, alleging rather, um, that it, the case, it's just the case of the lockdown not working? We haven't had um, a serious lockdown, so to say, because even when um, the government said there was a lockdown, there wasn't really a lockdown. People were still moving around, and the figures were also still going up. Uh, but what has played out since um, yesterday is, um, I don't know, it's like people just feel that they're free. There's this um, wave of freedom, you know, we're free, you know, we're out of the cage, so let us just jump into the streets and everybody threw caution into the wind and uh, not realizing the fact that you know um, coronavirus is real um, it's with us and people need to be more careful how they mingle where they go to and what they do so what's your take on the whole lockdown scenario there are arguments for it and against it some looking at it from the economic primarily uh, from the economic um, aspect and others are saying this is more of a, a vote um, management situation uh, as per politics well you can't um, <clears throat> you can't rule out politics from it uh, because um, the reason why you can't rule out politics is um, our leaders you know um, started on the wrong footing um, in the sense that you don't lock down the system without educating the people well. Nigerians were not properly educated, they were not properly informed, there was not much awareness. There was this fringy over what has happened in Italy, um, Spain and US. So all of that <clears throat> added together, you know, made the Nigerian government to um, go ahead and lock down the system. But then, don't also forget that, you know, in locking down, we, we didn't, we, it's, not a, it's not like a Nigerian thing. We also copied it from um, abroad, but we didn't copy other things. When they locked down, they have a database which they use to reach out to their people and, you know, alleviated their sufferings. But the Nigerian system, we just locked it down and then people started shouting, you know, palliative, we're hungry, we're dying. And then I keep asking, you know, I remember I said this last time I was here, you locked down a system. And yet, you have one million boys threatening the whole of Lagos. How were they gathering themselves? I also miss that. Some people also thought that maybe the increasing level of insecurity um, that is being attributed to, the, uh, to um, unemployment as a result of the lockdown, uh, people cannot do any job, they are not getting income, and they need to eat on a daily basis, could also have added to it. Yeah, but we're also missing something. I mean, um, I, I know that during that period, coming to this place, you know, there are so many checkpoints. They have to stop you. They have to know who you are, why you're on the road. So how come the one million boys were gathering? Is it so? Something is something is. There's a sinister arrangement somewhere that we're not sure of. 
But well, I, by the way, it has always been argument about the number of uh, police officers. Do we have enough people actually to, I mean, officers to uh, police the number of people just in Lagos only? Don't forget that the lockdown was just in three places: Lagos, Ogun State, and Abuja. Even then. So we, need, I mean, obviously we had enough manpower to do that. If the police is not enough, you deploy the soldiers. Normally, when there's a lockdown, it is the soldiers that come out. Nigerians don't have. You, now you that, and that I know that a lot gone. of Nigerians just believe that you can pay your way through with a police officer. That hasn't gone so well. The soldiers being on the street, we've known that some civilians have been uh, killed uh, in the during the period of this lockdown. But let's let's not deviate. Let's take a look at the you know issues that it's part of it, though. But let's try and streamline the conversation and look at your assessment of government's uh, measures. Uh, yes, they are saying that um, a lockdown is being eased, but we all have a personal responsibility to maintain social distance, to make sure we use face masks and, you know, um, issues like that. What's your assessment of compliance level to that directive as regards this lockdown? We're day two in. Well, the compliance level is zero, unfortunately. Um, and I think it stems from the fact that we still have a lot of people educated out there who are instigating the people, misinforming the people, and telling the people that this whole thing does not exist. So there's a breach of trust between the people and the government. The people don't trust the government. And when people don't trust the government, they don't take anything said by the government seriously. People have been asking questions. All the money donated you know, by corporate organizations, individuals, what is government doing with it? Good, I give it to NCDC. Every day they give us a daily briefing. But people also need to know the funds that were targeted, were, were, were set aside for this project, how it's being utilized. You need to carry the people around. That's what accountability is. So if the government is being accountable to the people, if the government is doing what it should do in creating awareness, I think the people will comply. But unfortunately, unfortunately, even some leaders, even some religious men are still telling their members that this thing does not exist. So there's a big problem. Well, a lot of people would um, disagree with you and say the government has done a lot of enlightenment. Uh, you go on social media, even the people that don't actually understand what COVID-19 is, they'll say coro, coro, uh, coronavirus or corona virus, you know. We even have COVID-19 uh, or COVID-9, you know. There is some level of, you know, understanding that we are in a certain kind of situation. But then again, people say that governments um, appeal to people's conscience to take responsibility. We are in this together. Is that enough? Considering the spike in cases we are getting, uh, is that enough? When, really? you say, when you say government has created awareness, there's so much awareness on social media. Even at that, on that same social media, a lot of people don't still believe. Now, we're not talking of awareness for people who have television in their house, who have light. We're talking of awareness in the rural areas, in the villages, in the slums. This is where the awareness should be, to the grassroots. When it comes to doing campaign, the politicians know how to get to the grassroots. So I'm saying to the politicians, this is the time to get to the grassroots. If this message gets to the grassroots, it will come up back to the elite. What you have on social media, how many people are on social media? We're we are said to be 200 million. How many of us are on social media? Even on the social media, how many of them believe in COVID? Now, if, even if, for even me, if, let, let me, let me play the devil's advocate for a second and say, even if you don't believe a lot of persons are aware of this, well, the palliatives that are being shared, admittedly, it's not getting to enough people. But it is supposed to be for the vulnerable in the society. Some of the people you refer to that live in the slums, in other areas, that should have known. So it goes back again to the question I was asking you about the appeal by government to the consciences, or conscience rather, of people. Is that enough at this time, um, considering that one day into the lockdown we have this number? What guarantees are there that we'll have more? Let me tell you the truth. A country without a database cannot prepare and cannot plan for the social well-being of the people. And so when government said, poorest of the poor, I'm, 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 I'm taking aback. I'm wondering who is not poor in this country today. 
We actually have two classes. You're either poor or you're rich. There is no middle class anymore. But then, you know, I would say this, and I've been saying it, that the action you and I take today will determine how long COVID-19 will last. Everybody needs to take responsibility. And it starts from the home. The mother, the father, needs to take responsibility to educate the children. And then you move a step further. The churches agreed. The religious institutions have been shut down. But they are on air. If a pastor is going to preach for 30 minutes, let him use 10 minutes to educate his members on the need to follow directives of the medical people. It is very, very important. So everybody, yes, everybody needs to take responsibility. And I'll say, you know, throwing open the lockdown is like, okay, you guys, it's in your hands. Do what you want to do. You, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the first word that came to my mind, but you know that we have a tricky relationship with authority in this country, except there is some measure of uh, puni uh, punishment. Uh, the threat of arrest, uh, knowing you will probably be released, uh, might not serve as enough deterrent. But let's look at the, the warning by the NCDC boss that if the rates of non-compliance by Nigerians continue, there is every likelihood that the president will recall lockdown um, in, in states. What do you make of that? Unfortunately, uh, a second unfortunately part I mean, that. Nigerian, just yeah. as you are, but a lot of us are not serious. It is somebody who is alive that has hope for tomorrow. It is somebody who is alive that has a job for tomorrow. It is somebody who is alive that actually have to take care of his children for tomorrow. And I think that is where people should start thinking. The issue now is no longer an issue of government, governance, because if we, if we keep saying governance, governance, Nigerians will not move forward. But the thing is that we need to tell ourselves the gospel truth. The gospel truth is that coronavirus is real. The gospel truth is that people need to begin to live responsibly. Because at the end of it, we're still talking about, about at the end of the, a lot of things are going to change. I mean, I know that once this thing is over, nobody will shake hands. It will be difficult for people to hug. And as it is right now, everybody is a suspect. So I think that is the consciousness people should have. Because it is real. No matter, no matter, no matter the, the, the theory uh, anybody wants to give, coronavirus is real. People are dying of it. Do you think that uh, um, President Mohammed Bukhari is going to um, bring back the lockdown, even if he is going to bring back the lockdown? Some people will argue, what really is the point? Because we've, we have 2,802 cases. As at the time the original lockdown was announced, we were not right. up to 200. To be honest, okay. oh. we weren't up to 200 when the uh, initial lockdown was announced. And then subsequently, well, I don't think we're up to 500 when the president said, shut down these three states. So isn't it a case of one step forward, three steps back? If, we, if now the NCDC chairman is saying, oh, if you don't comply, the president is going to lock down the But that's the ideal again. thing to do. Let us, let us remove politics. Let us remove sentiments. You know, I think that the president owes a duty to Nigerians, first and foremost, to protect life and property. And life is more important than any other thing. So I think that if the uh, DG of NCDC is saying that, he's seeing something you and I are not seeing. I mean, every day I try to you know, update my, my followers on social media on the numbers. And I know quite a lot of them will come to me and tell me, how much have you been paid for doing this? What's all this? This is not real. This is not, these people are just eating money. You understand? So. It's unfortunate that things have been you know, going this way. It simply shows that there is, there's been a complete decay in governance in this country. And so this government, with this COVID-19, needs to prove to the Nigerian people that they can actually trust government. It's not going to be easy, but they need to begin to do things that will show the people that this government cares for you. This government has time for you. This government believes in you.
Okay, before, before I uh, move on to the, question, uh, the next question, that is if it's relevant um, now, it's to, under, to get your perspective really. I think I asked you this question earlier, but I didn't get, quite get your response as to, do you think this um, relaxation of lockdown was uh, based on political consideration or economic consideration or a mixture of the two, including security? I didn't quite get that. Because mixture of all and the agitation of Nigerians. The Nigerians were really agitating. They felt, why are you locking us down? I mean, if you've been on social media, you understand. A lot of people were saying that this whole lockdown, don't forget, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about 5G network and all of that. You know, and you know, it, government didn't come out well to explain herself. Because a lot of videos started showing where um, um, supposedly 5G was launched in Abuja and all of that. And then, you, you know, when you now see people you believe should know better, telling you that, oh, this thing is because of this, because of this. So a lot of people now felt that, oh, they're locking us down because they want to lay cables. And that is why I keep saying the National Orientation Agency has failed Nigerians and continues to fail Nigerians. At that point in time, they were supposed to come up and educate Nigerians and tell Nigerians the truth of what is on ground. But you have allowed these conspiracy theories to get into the mindset of the people. So now government is struggling to, you know, change their mindset. Okay. That, 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 um, is, I think the question still falls uh, based on your response. So it's a combination of all of these. So um, what I'm trying going, going to ask is, we are already beginning to be short of bed spaces. There are arguments about palliatives being shared. There are arguments about how government is going about managing um, the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, is it enough at this time? You know, you, what we have. OK, me... but I think, let me rephrase that. Okay. Is, is some people say it's being caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, on the one hand, you're considering the economy, and then you're thinking about the increasing number of infections that are likely to arise, and as we evidently have more cases. So, what are your thoughts about this very tight position that government is in? Well, um, this is where you test the will of government. You also test how prepared the government is. Um, yes, I know that it is tough for government, but I also know that you know government needs to take some harsh decisions that a lot of people will not. You can't really please everybody, but the important thing is that government must take a decision that ensures that at least 80% of her citizens are protected. It is very, very important. You know, so talking about you know scarcity of bed space and all of that, there are so many government buildings, housing papers. Move those papers away, convert them to where you can house patients. It's as simple as ABCD. And that's why I said government needs to think as if there is no box. They need to be proactive in their, in their thinking. The federal, the old federal sectorial is there in Ikoi, wasting away. The whole money spent building um, a shelter at um, Unico Stadium should have been spent refurbish that place. That place will take almost everybody. So government needs to begin to think, you know, ahead, you know, plan ahead. And that's why I keep saying, without a database, it becomes difficult for you to plan. Okay, I I'm told we have, um, because the next question I was going to ask, I've been trying to avoid those medical um, uh, questions. It has to do with uh, issues with the hospitals. Um, I'm joined now via Skype, rather we are joined via <coughs> Skype by Olamide Okuladia. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having all right, there are talks about possible neglect of other medical cases by hospitals as a result of the pandemic. Some hospitals are rejecting patients, apparently. Uh, that was made known to us by um, the Ministry of Health. What would be your suggestion on how other cases, especially critical ones, can get the attention that they need in spite of the pandemic situation that we have? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that we're in a public health emergency. And when there's a public health emergency, uh, the government usually takes the lead in terms of ensuring the safety of people 
uh, both for the public health emergency and then for other ailments that people may have um, that do not exactly tally with the public health emergency. Um, if you look at the database, you would find that over the last several weeks, we have found a lot of medical personnel, um, especially in the private sector, that have been infected with the COVID um, virus. Uh, and the reason why this has happened is because um, there are certain um, criteria and precautions that need to be taken uh, before you attend to a COVID patient. Um, it's not just the wearing of a full PPE, but if you do not take some certain precautions, especially in the management of the space of your hospital, then you will be prone to having this virus. Okay. And so because a lot of private sector organizations have gone out to manage this without the um, guidance of government, they have exposed themselves and have been infected. Now, what this has now done is that it has created a ricochet effect in the medical space where people are now afraid to even talk to anyone um, that has any symptom that is slightly related to COVID. How, how can we mitigate <laughs> this, actually, because we're pressed for time? How yes. can we mitigate, how, how can, in spite of this reality that we have, because there, there are other people with other cases that are even more... Um, um, uh, terminal, or should I say, or more deadly than uh, the flu uh, as it stands now. Some people with chronic heart condition, kidney that needs transplant, you have uh, diabetic patient, patients with complication and some other cases. So Lagos State is doing several things in trying to address this. One of the main things that Lagos State has done is through its Lagos State Health Management Agency, which is the body that handles Lagos State Health Insurance, Lagos State is offering telemedicine services. Uh, for free at this point because of the emergency. And basically, it's um, 08,000 Ecomed. And basically, you call into this telemedicine service and you're able to speak to a doctor. Now, if the doctor feels that they should refer you to a hospital, then under the private providers that are being, or the hospitals that are managed by the Lagos State Health Management Agency, they refer you to one of the hospitals. So there's a history of where you're coming from. Another thing that Lagos State is doing is through um, the Health Facilities Monitoring and Accreditation Agency, they are beginning to train um, hospitals, especially the private providers, in the management of COVID patients in how they, are, you know, they should receive them. And if they, they can manage them, they accredit them. And if they can't, direct them to refer them to where they can be managed. And what right. this will essentially do is build the confidence of the private sector and other hospitals in the public uh, to be able to attend to patients that are not just um, that are not COVID patients, so that we can improve the accessibility of patients to care. Okay, quickly before uh, I let you go, um, what would be your suggestion up, up from the? first day of the relaxation, we saw what happened. What other ways do you think um, government can employ to educate people on the importance of complying with the basic rules that will help us mitigate the spread of this virus so that we don't kill our economy um, while we're trying to kill it? Well, um, I think a battle that government has faced hugely is having to balance between people's lives and livelihoods. And it's a very delicate balance because if you choose either, it has detrimental effect. Um, one of the things that we saw in lifting the first, uh, the lockdown on the first day was the need for people to go out there and facilitate some level of business that they can, largely because we are in an informal society where majority of people uh, work in the informal sector. And so they, they do day-to-day -day transactions and they live on, you know, whatever daily income that they can get. And so when that lockdown happened, of course, there, there was a huge outflow. And we won't be surprised if we have a spike in the number of people that come down with the COVID uh, virus. Uh, I mean, I can't say that I have the answers, but I think that... Um, you know, in taking the next definite steps, there are certain things that need to be evaluated and certain criteria uh, that needs to be met 
for, for the next steps to happen. I mean, it's very easy to blame government, and it's also very easy to blame people. But if we put aside the blame game, and we all come together at the table to say, look, how can we solve this issue? Um, this is not the point to blame anyone. Everybody's trying their best okay. to be able to do the best that they can, including government. Right. And so what government will appreciate is um, constructive contributions to see how we can all battle against this public health emergency. No right. one has the experience. Nobody has ever dealt with this kind of virus before. So everybody's leaning on the job and putting, you know, into play the resources available. I'm so trying hard not to interject, <laughs> but I'm afraid we are out of time for this segment. Um, I'm sorry to interject so often. Thank you so much uh, for that submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be back with you um, in a bit. And of course, uh, we're back with Francis. Uh, I suspect you agree to some of his submission on um, ad advising people quickly. In no, yeah, no, I'm, like I said, it, you know, we need to trade with politics and realize that we have uh, a common war, a common enemy, and we must all come together to f defeat that common enemy. Thank you very much, Francis, for staying with us. We'll be back with you in a bit. And thank you for watching thus far, but we're not done. The Senate introducing um, its own infectious disease control bill, a bit under a new name, is up for discussion. We'll be right back.